number 59 in our series, The Perfect Person of God. I, I do want to ju- uh, talk about one thing that we mentioned last week, and uh, that was this, it's actually not on the screen, I'm going to write it down, um, but this idea of purpose. So Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number one. So if you're a Presbyterian, the catechism, it, or, there are several catechisms we have uh, uh, in our book of confession. Westminster is probably the most famous I'm probably the most understood, the Westminster Divines, as we call them, shorter and longer catechism and the confession of faith. But the first question is, what is man's chief end? Chief end of man. What is it? Glorify Glorify and enjoy. That's the chief end, and, and that's the purpose. People say, what's the purpose of life? Westminster had written that down years, and I mean, 500 years ago. Uh, so this is the chief end. Now, there's some questions about what, it, what does this mean? Because we, we read in Scripture, what is the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? Jesus, the greatest commandment is to... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the second one. But Jesus, when, when Jesus is asked the question, he says it's one A, is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and you can put strength. And then one B is love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you can't love your neighbor as you love yourself, really, unless you do the first one, correct? Um, people say, oh, well, I, you know, I'm just going to focus on the loving my neighbor bit. Um, not loving God. Well, Jesus would say, well, that you can't do that. One, one flows out of the other, because if you're not loving your neighbor with a godly love, a love that's motivating them towards God, then it's not, uh, it's not real love, right? So we have this concept of love God and love neighbor. So you could make the argument that the chief end of man is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So why didn't Westminster just quote the Bible? That's Marilyn's question. Similar to Terry's question to me this week, similar question. So why not? Let's unpack for a second what does it mean to glorify? What does glorify mean? Okay, so um, I'm going to have to get another. um, So glorify, I'm going to write this down so that equals. Okay, what else? Praise is part of it for sure. Praise and worship. How is worship different than praise? I'm going to put it separately because it is different, but how is it different? Okay, so there's another level. So it's almost like a deeper level. Worship is like a deeper level than just praise. Like praise, praise is really, and we're splitting hairs a little bit. You understand? This is what theologians do. By the way, you're all theologians. Congratulations. You've always been theologians, whether you knew it or not. Because the moment you start to ask questions and seek answers about God, you become a theologian. People say, well, I don't do theology, I just read my Bible. Well, then you are a theologian. Because as soon as you ask what does it mean, you, you're doing the work of theology. So praise really is... It, it's, a little, yeah, it's a little bit more like gratitude, thanksgiving. It's more based on attributes uh, and... and Again, it's splitting hairs, really, right? It's what it, you know, when we talk about why we worship, what, what's the focus of our worship? It's who God is. That's God just because he's God. The, the, you know, the, the mercy, the grace, the justice, the truth, the magnitude, the, I mean, you just keep adding attributes and what he's done, right? So now is God worthy of our praise if he's done nothing? Yeah, because he's God, but, but. By virtue of us praising God, he's, we already know he has done something. Because if we're the ones doing it, what has he done? He's created us. So even, let's, pre, let's pretend. This is suspend disbelief. Okay, this is a pretend moment. 
Are you guys ready? This is imagination. Pretend Jesus never came. Is God still worthy of praise? Yeah. Pretend God did not create the nation of Israel. Is God still worthy of praise? Would he be worthy of praise for what he has done? Not just his attributes, but what he has done. Yes, because at the very minimum, if we are praising him, what has he done? He's created us. So at the very minimum, we praise God for what he has done in creating us, right? And we worship God based on his... So to Chuck's point, which is great, you can praise people because of their great attributes, and you can praise them for what they've done, but that doesn't mean you, let, uh, you elevate them to the point of you worshiping them, right? We, we praise people all the time, and that's a, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. But when we worship, we're elevating them to the point of beyond praise. We're, we're saying that they are the center of our being, the center of our existence. So one of the reasons that the Westminster Confession or Westminster Shorter Catechism uses glorified is because praise and worship equal glory, equal glorifying. Now, what else does it mean to glorify? So there's a recognition portion, which can be praise and can be worship, but it's not necessarily pra- what we would categorize as praise and worship. Okay. Respect. What else? But do you think it's not in glorify? Why not? Is the dictionary? Okay, so let's talk about what does it mean to enjoy something. That's why it says glorify and enjoy. What does it mean to enjoy something? Presence, okay. You like it. You like it. What else? Can you really enjoy something you don't love? No, it's not. It's really not. That's not splitting hairs. If you love something, oh, let's turn it around the other way. If you, but you say that all the time, right? What's your favorite meal? Really? So today's a good day for Maryland hamburgers. Kids are kids got you covered. Have you ever had a great hamburger that you really are enjoying? What's the word that we use to describe that? Man, I love that hamburger. Now, is it the same? This is why, this is why I think Westminster's brilliant in how they... Because remember, the catechism is not... It's trying to reduce. It's, trying to, it's reductionistic. I get it. It's trying to take everything the scripture says. Everything the scripture says about our relationship to God on this planet and, re- and reduce it down to a simple one sentence answer. What's the, what's the purpose of a catechism? The purpose of a catechism is to instill truth in simple terms, simple ways. Now I know for us in the 21st century, looking back at something that was written in the 16th, the 15th, 16th century, we're like, that's not simple, but you got to remember what, what, you know, what, it, who, who used the shorter catechism in church? Who used it? Children. They didn't have Sunday school. They didn't have VBS. It was the catechism, the shorter catechism. And who used the longer catechism? Adults. And they memorized it. Why? Because they believed it was profound theological truth in ways that were understandable and bite-sized. And it gave meaning to what they did. So go back to the idea of enjoy. You say, well, Zach, you're, you're taking a meal, what we, how we use to describe a meal and also applying it to God. And that's, we would think of that as blasphemy because we think God is all elevation, all elevated, and we forget the condescension. There are degrees of love, actually types of love, but all of those types, well, I'll say all of them, but all the degrees of love can be applied to God. Because, see, glorify 
in the Bible also includes love. When you praise and worship something, it's an elevated love. When you enjoy something, it's a condescended love. Now, I say condescended. I know that's a word that we don't like to use. We say we condescend to someone. But guess what? The only way God relates to us is by condescending to us. Because he's always up here and we're always down here. But because God loves us, he came from up here to down here in the form of Christ, Jesus. Well, in Jesus, but even before Jesus, in his relationship with, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And, and because he, the fact that he, he takes his communication and he limits it to speech, that's condescension. Well, it is. Because does God, does God need to use a language to communicate, like actual words? Does God speak to, to, in, the, in the Trinitarian relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you think they actually use words to, when they talk to each other? No. Why? Because words are something we need. So for, when God speaks to Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1... Just the usage of language is condescension because he's limiting. Because let me just tell you, God's communication to us, if we could, if we could absorb it, would be a lot more profound if we didn't use words. Well, we can't even comprehend what that looks like because we're, we're finite. Right? Are you, are you tracking with me here? Infinite God, finite people, he still communicates with us. So to do that... He speaks to us in language we can understand. And that's, that's why we get so confused all the time because God's trying to communicate or is communicating, not trying to, God doesn't try, he just does. God is communicating profound truth, profound power when we can't handle all of it. So he has to reach down. So the idea of enjoyment to us, the, the, the idea of enjoyment is, is, is important because it's not, this is what, that's what I actually say in my sermon in classic today. We sometimes reduce knowing God to just knowing things about God. Knowing Jesus to knowing facts about Jesus. When really knowledge in all the scripture is about glorification and enjoyment. Experiencing it, taking it in, relishing it, getting excited about it. And, and, and then talking about it and continuing to kind of regurgitate it for other people. I'm uh, using a lot of words in weird ways today. I don't you know, like the word regurgitate either. But that's really what it is, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and, and see, even with that, like, this is not so. Uh, this is a process. This is, it's not like you wake up one day and you're suddenly perfect at glorifying God and enjoying everything there is to enjoy about God. There are certain things about God and what He said to us I don't enjoy. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. Like, like the sermon I preached today, for example, I mean, listen, guys, I spent a long time getting a lot of degrees. And they were tough, and I'm proud of those things. But what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 is that stuff is garbage. And I'm like, thanks a heap. You could have saved me a ton of time, Paul. But there's, there's saying that and saying, well, I, okay, well, okay, there's... There's ha you know, having those things that God's given us as a gift and enjoying them as a gift, and then there's basing our entire joy on those, those gifts. Do you, you know what I'm saying? So the enjoyment part is important because if, if we don't seat our joy in the Lord, we're going to seat our joy in something else. It, we have no choice. And so that's... To me, it's so odd to think of these stuffy old dudes in Westminster, England, like saying, you know what we need to do is we need to focus on joy for a second. 
We need to focus on the experience of living into it. The reason I think they don't use the term love is because, one, the, the, the definitions of love are so broad and they can apply in ways that, don't, that, that do and don't apply to God. So for the, the, and I think we've talked about this before, but for the Greeks, there are at least five different words for the word love. And, and in some respects, they're all applied to a human relationship to God. Some of them are a little tougher for us to swallow. Like the word eros, where we get the word erotic. That's harder for us to apply that to our relationship to God. But if you read the Song of Solomon, that concept is right smack dab in the middle of it. It makes me really uncomfortable a lot of the time. But that's why I think the word enjoy is an experiential word that reminds us that, that the relationship that God has with human beings It is not just, so we all, and, and, and Presbyterians are really good at this, thinking about it as always being just a one-way relationship. It's only what God does for us. And from a salvation standpoint, it is only what God does for us. But there's always a response, what humans do in response to what God has done for us. And that's where the enjoyment part comes in. Because if it's, if, it's, if it's just glorify, think about what you lose if you, if, you, if you take out the enjoyment part. What do you lose? Well, George, you said fun, right? And a lot of times we don't apply that term to our faith life. And I think that is what we lose. We lose the concept that God is the author. What does is, what is, what is James say? How many, how many gifts come from God? How many of them? All of them. He says, every good, every good, and every perfect gift comes from God, comes from the Father of light. So that hamburger, Marilyn, that you're going to enjoy today, and you're going to say at the end of it, man, I love that hamburger. We say that as an offering, if with the eyes of faith, we say that as a, as a moment of praise to the God who is the giver of that hamburger. I think... I don't know if you have a real... No, I'm just playing. <laughs> but I, I, sometimes, like I've had a pickup truck before. Uh, I, I will say sometimes your wife loves that you have a pickup truck too, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, no, I think, I, think we, I think that's one of the reasons that the word enjoy and glorify are used. Because the word love is applied so broadly, right? And, and, and it can be, and I know the word enjoy for us is very confusing, but for the, the writers of the Westminster Divines, they're reallocating a concept that I think is, is something that sometimes we lose, that, that God... And I even said this the first week in this sermon series, we're talking about happiness. I used to poo-poo the idea that God wanted us to be happy. He said, God doesn't care if we're happy. He cares if we have joy. Oh, because joy is more of an important gravity word. But you know, in the Greek, the word karas, it means joy and happiness, both. And it's used interchangeably in the, the Bible. But I think that, that that's part of the reason that this glorify God, this praise and worship of God. But again, worship is not limited to what we do in the sanctuary, what we do in Loudon Hall, right? What is worship? Worship is seeding your whole life around that thing. The thing that you worship, the person that you worship is at the center of your life. Anything else is not worship. It's not. Wor I, I get a little bit, uh, um, and sometimes we say this here, and I don't really love it, and I, I, I really try not to get too ticky-tacky with it. But when someone says, hey, let's join together in worship. Unless you're already coming in with a concept of I'm worshiping God, you're not, you're not joining anybody in worship. Because unless God has got your finances, and God has got your time, and God has got your energy, you're not singing songs is not worship. 
Singing songs is an expression of that which is already part of your life. That's where the love part, that's where the, the, the high end love part comes in. Because worship is, is loving something to such an extent that it becomes everything you do. It becomes the motivating factor of all that you do. And that's the great struggle of every human being. Because we vacillate. We vacillate in what we worship. And even the best Christian, even the best follower of Jesus on this planet, we vacillate in what we worship moment to moment, day to day, hour by hour. Because in one moment, we're like, yes, God is everything. Jesus Christ is everything to me. I'm doing everything to him for, for him. And then the next day, we, we wake up and we go to our offices and, and the to-do list comes. And what we're worshiping is the next thing on our to-do list. Everybody does. I do that too. And I work in a church. You would think my to-do list would be an act of worship. And on my better days, it is. But on my worst days, it's not. On my worst days, it's just get through it. Right? But the, the goal is to constantly be reorienting ourselves back to that center of loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is a, the declaration of worship at its heart. I know I've muddied the water even further for you, so I'm mission accomplished on my end. Yeah, Terry. Yeah, I'm getting back to the corporate stuff. Yeah. Uh, the catechism of the Jesus like man uh, says our preferences. Uh, and I pointed out to you in the, some of the things in Romans that yeah. this is what God says our preferences are. So, but those are not mutually exclusive. So you're talking about the Romans 8.28. That was the Romans 8.28 passage. So... Uh, Terry emailed me a question about Romans 8.28, which, which, by the way, is uh, it's my life verse, right? So, in Romans 8.27, Paul writes, He who searches hearts knows what's the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work, all things for those who love God... All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And then he goes on to say, for those he, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers. So your point is that the purpose of life is to live into the purposes of God. And, and, and I think the Westminster point is glorify God and enjoy him, ever, and enjoy him, him forever is the purposes of God. And it's like what I said last week. What is God's purpose? Why do, what is God, when God, now I pretend God wakes up. God doesn't wake up. God doesn't slumber nor sleep. But pretend he does. If, when God wakes up in the morning, what's he saying? This is my motivating factor. What's God's motivating factor? And please don't say to love us, because that is not it. He wants us to love him, but so his motivating factor is... To increase the love for himself. No, you're right. God's motivating factor is to increase the glory for himself. To increase the worship for himself. And, and that includes us. But before it was us, it was what he created. It was the cosmos. It was, you, you know, you name it. We don't really know how it worked pre, pre-creation. He hasn't told us all that. But God's motivating factor is his purpose God's purpose is to increase his own glory. And again, like I said last week, that sounds incredibly selfish. And you're right, it is incredibly selfish. But guess what? God is the only being that is allowed to be selfish. If God is not selfish, he's an idolater. And he can't be an idolater because idolatry is sin. You say, well, selfishness is a sin. For us, it is a sin. Because for us to be selfish is idolatry. For him to be selfish is not idolatry because he's God. You guys get this? I know this is a really confusing concept, really confusing, but it's the only way it works. Be yeah, go ahead. The same. Yes. God's in purpose and our in purpose are the same to glorify him. And enjoy him. God enjoys being God. I don't know if you guys realize this. God is like psyched about being God. I don't know what his alternative would be if he wasn't God. This isn't like, you know, a movie where he can say, I'm going to check out. I'm not going to be God anymore. Um, he 
None of this is in my notes, by the way. We're just, we're just chatting. But I, I think this is important, though, because when, it, when we get back to what, what, what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel of Matthew, this is, the, this is central. This is a very, I mean, this is like, you know, you have a foundation of, of your building, but below the foundation, you got to still have solid ground, right? And below solid ground, you got to have even more solid ground. If you start to have loose ground underneath the ground that's above it, you get sinkholes. So we're talking about way down here. And this is like the core earth stuff, right? This is, this, because to understand this gets us back to, okay, so why does, why does, why does Jesus send his son? You know, why does, why does God go back to, this is one of the things I'm trying to teach my son right now. Because my son, if you talk to my son right now, he hates Adam and Eve. I mean, constantly complains about Adam and Eve. That's exactly it. He's like, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be. I was like, well, if it wasn't for them, you probably wouldn't be born. Just saying. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have Jesus. If it, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't understand mercy or grace. And you say, well, why does God, why did, why did God, and I, this, is, this is Zach terminology, I don't like to use the term allow. God doesn't allow things. Why does God in his providential care ordain that Adam and Eve should sin? Why? What's the purpose? To glorify himself. How does it glorify himself? Because it shows the rest of the cosmos something that cannot be shown without, without it, which is mercy and grace. You don't need mercy if everybody's perfect. You don't need mercy. If, if people are, if you're perfect, I don't need to be merciful because you got nothing to need mercy for. You guys get this? You don't need grace if you're perfect. Then all we would know about God is justice and truth. And that's great. God is justice and God, God is truth. But that's, but, but in God's providential care, this is why he can say in Romans 8, 28, he works out all things for good to those that love him and call according to his purpose. How can God do that? Unless there are some bad things that happen, those bad things can't be used for good. Then we know something about God's power over evil. Well, guess what? If, if sin doesn't exist, then we don't know mercy. We don't. If that story doesn't happen, then we don't understand mercy and grace. Now, I understand that that's a theological slippery slope with that. Because then someone would come back at me, and I, this is what atheists do. They say, well, you're saying God is the author of sin. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. That God, in his providential care, in his plan, ordained that Adam and Eve should sin. Did God cause the sin? No. But in his providential care, he ordained that it should happen. This is why some people like the term allow. I don't like the term allow because then it takes God off of the driver's seat. And God is still in the driver's seat. And you say, well, how can God be in the driver's seat and not in the driver's seat at the same time? I don't know. That's just how it works. But then when we get to the sin part, then we understand the need for a Savior. And when we understand the need for a Savior, then we understand that the grace and the mercy of God is not just that he desires to save us, but that he actually gets involved in the salvation, that he gets in the muck of it all, that he gets into the mire of it. That, go, that takes the grace and the mercy part and, and cranks it up to 11. Because not only is he saying, you know what I'm going to do? And this is one of the great heresies. This is one of the heresies of the early church. The heresy of the early church is that Jesus was not God. Do you know this? One of the big heresies of the early church was that Jesus could not be God. But that God instead made him divine, like ish. This is like, this is part of the, and, and, and they, what they do is they misinterpret the concept of adoption. They, they, the, the early, this early, um, um, this early and, and the name of this heresy is escaping me. Um, but the idea was that Jesus was born like a normal human being, but that at his baptism, he was given divine power, and that's why he had to be baptized. 
He was given divine purposes, and that's why he went on that mission. But he was not himself. He was the son of God by adoption, just like we're sons and daughters of God. But he was himself not, like, he was not the second person of the Trinity. Now, we know that's patently stupid, but that's what they believed. Why? Because they were like, well, God could never condescend that low to our sin. Because they, they couldn't wrap their minds around the, the greatness of the mercy of God. That, that, that the mercy was that big. It was big, but it's not that big. And, that, and, 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 and when you get the early church fathers, they begin to start unpacking what the scripture actually says. They say, That's heresy. You look at the actual, what the Bible actually tells us about Jesus. It says he's God. This is why Peter says in Matthew 16, when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? He says, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And he's not saying by adoption, the, the terminology he's, he's using would be considered blasphemy by every other Jewish man and woman around him, except the disciples. And that's why Jesus turns around again and says to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you because it doesn't make sense. Now I'm adding the it doesn't make sense part, but he did say flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but who? Only my father in heaven, only God could reveal that to Peter because it did not make sense to anybody that God would become flesh. The incarnation was absolutely like ridiculous to people. That God's mercy and that his grace was that big that he would get involved in the sin. Not by himself sinning, but by actually what Paul says, by becoming sin for us. He who knew no sin becomes sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's what Paul writes. Oh, it's definitely complicated. But it's also really profoundly simple. I mean, this is, again, Westminster, in the Westminster Divine said that the things that are necessary for salvation are obvious. The things that are necessary for salvation. Is all this that I'm talking about necessary for salvation for you to grab this like, and get it? Like to really like, oh yeah, you got to have, because when you get to heaven, the first thing that Jesus is going to do is hand you a big final exam <laughs> and say, you better get an 80 or you're out. No. The only question that matters that's necessary for salvation is who's your Lord and Savior? And do you trust him? Now, having said that, there are a lot of people that say Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, but they aren't, they aren't talking about Jesus in the Bible. It's like an invented Jesus. They like, like do the Thomas Jefferson thing. You, know, it's not, you guys know Thomas Jefferson wrote a version of the Gospels, right? And what did he do? Do you know what he did? You know what the Jefferson Bible really is? He cut a lot of stuff out. It's the Gospels without the miracles. Because Jefferson couldn't wrap his mind around the miracles. He was a good enlightenment boy, right? He had been, spent all that time with people in Paris reading Voltaire. And he's like, no, no, no. Um, miracles don't happen. They do if it's God. When you, get, when you write the rules, you can unwrite them too. That's, that's how God performs miracles. So how does oh my goodness. You know, it's been a long, you know, the, since the Tebbies aren't, haven't been here, it's been a long time since we've had Nancy Tebby ask me a good question. How does predestination, well, it does. It fits just like, how, you know, just like talking about Adam and Eve, right? God, we believe from first to last, salvation is an act of God. From first to last. What does that mean? That means from the act of salvation, Jesus descending to earth, uh, living a, a perfect sinless life, dying on the cross, raising again, ascending into heaven, uh, empowering his people with the Holy Spirit, that is an act of God. And you say, well, okay, great, I get behind that. Now, how do you come to faith? Okay, so accepting, which is true, but this is where the, this is where the terminology gets slippery, right? Because whose work is that? Who's... Whose job is it to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Oh, is it ours or is it God's? The answer is yes. Right, Kay? The answer is yes. It's God's act because how, 
what Paul writes to us, and, and even, even in what we just read in Romans 8, when, when, when uh, Paul writes about salvation, he talks about the idea that we, all of our acts, all, everything that we do, are, uh, they're, they're, they're worthless rags before God. So the only way we can accept Christ as our Lord and Savior is if who empowers us to do so? The Holy Spirit. God by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we're going to say yes. It's the only way. Because I'm 100% of the time, apart from God's work, going to turn away from God. Because my desire, just like Adam and Eve, is to be my own boss. To be my own God. To make my own rules. So in my sinfulness, my sinfulness blocks me from doing anything righteous. What does Paul write? He says, there's no, there, there's no one righteous. No one. No, not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right? And in Ephesians, he said, it's an, it, salvation is not, our faith in Christ is not of works so that no one can boast. The problem is what we do is we say, yeah, I get that, that my salvation is not an act of myself. It's an act of Jesus Christ dying on the cross and being resurrected. But then I have faith in that. Well, we just added a work. Faith is not a work that we add to the, to the, to the uh, gospel. And, and a lot of times that's how we think of it. And, and to be honest, that's how we preach it most of the time. I, used to, I had a pastor friend one time who told me, he said, well, I'm a Calvinist theologically, but when I preach, I'm an Arminian, which, which means when I preach, I preach people's response. And I do the same thing. But behind that, the prayer is that God is intervening, right? The prayer is that God is intervening, that the faith is a gift of God. That is not of works that no one can boast. A person is not going to respond positively to God. Not going to respond positively to, to a call for salvation, a call to, to follow Jesus, unless the Holy Spirit enables them to do so. And the Holy Spirit is God. So again, salvation from first to last is an act of God. This is one of the reasons you can, you know, talk about the complicated nature of the of, of the Bible, but the simple. The simple gospel, and I've said it four times, Jesus Christ, Son of God, comes to earth, takes the form of a servant, dies on the cross because the death that we deserve, the wages of sin is death, and is raised to do life, offering us a chance to share in that glory. That's the gospel. It's pretty simple. How come people don't get it? Well, because the Holy Spirit hasn't enabled them to do so. That, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and how does how does how does that stubbornness get overwhelmed? A lot of people. How does the stubborn? But there are atheists that come to faith in Christ, right? C.S. Lewis, Josh McDowell, Lee Strobel. How does that happen? I mean, they the thing is, say, well, it's research. Well, they did the research before they came to faith, and sometimes it's in the second and third readings that they they come to faith. Um, only by the power of God. Again, who ordains the event that takes place? It's the power of God. I, I say this as a, per, a person of experience because I came to faith. I'd grown up in the church. I grew up in the church and totally was like, you know, that's awesome. 18 years old, I was like, I'm going to college. I'm going to do what all 18-year-olds that go to college do, and I am kicking this out of my life because it doesn't matter that's what i said and i'm talking a week before i'm supposed to go over to florida southern college i got super sick and ended up in the hospital for a week and god went you think you're getting out of this bed you're not getting out of this bed without me and i that's how i felt i mean i felt it and i'll never forget that it was an act of God that opened my... And I knew all the scriptures. I knew it. I was raised in the church. I'd been preaching for crying out loud for a year, and I didn't believe it. I'm not the only one that does that, by the way. Did... John Wesley was a missionary for 10 years before he came to faith in Jesus. 
So it's not, that happens. That happens. Um, but it's only an act of God that takes place. That's where predestination comes in. That God, in his foreknowledge, knows who he is. Cho- it's, it's a choice. God makes the choice. He's predestined that to take place. And then the other, the, the, the negative question, well, why some people and not others? The better question is, why anybody? Why anybody? Because it's mercy. Nope. Nope. Uh... No, that's not going to be enough space. You guys know what that is? It's not just a pretty flower. This is the five points of Calvinism. This is the one that people have a hard time with a lot. Total depravity, that why didn't make it quite. Total depravity, what does that mean? What is depravity? Lack of. It means that every human being in every part is affected by sin. There's not one part of a a human being that's not affected by sin. This goes against Arminianism, which says that people are mostly good, and they have the ability on their own, apart from an act of God, and by Arminianism, I mean Methodism. So think of the United Methodist Church, think of the Assemblies of God and all of their ilk, they don't believe this. They don't believe this. In fact, one time, this is funny, um, I was driving down, uh, uh, and you might have seen this, um, Florida Avenue, and there's a Church of Christ, that big Church of Christ that's on, right, on, right on there. They've got that brick building. They've got that marquee. I'm telling you, once a week, for five weeks, they went through all five points of Calvinism and said, total depravity is unbiblical. Unconditional election. Which this one I don't get, but... Unconditional election, they said, is unbiblical. Limited atonement, they said, is unbiblical. By the way, I think these are all biblical. Just for the record, I'm getting this on, because I'm a, I'm a five-point Calvinist. Whoops, atonement. This is what you're talking about, um, irresistible grace. And the perseverance of the saints. You guys are seeing how bad my handwriting really is now. Um, So the idea of total depravity is that we are totally in, in our being. Not are we as bad as we could be. That is not what total depravity is talking about. Total depravity is not talking about everybody is as bad as they could be. No, because of the common grace of God, which, which you know, blankets the entire planet, we're not as bad as we could be. But every part of us is affected by sin. Our minds, our hearts, our relationships, everything is affected by sin such that we cannot choose salvation and God, you know, God's will on our own. Unconditional election means that God chooses whom he chooses based on what? What's the word? Well, that's a really, I'm sorry, that's really terribly written. Um, Total depravity explains that, though. So, um, what does unconditional mean? What? It's by, the reason that God chooses is by grace. There is no condition that you and I can bring to the table that can earn our place before God. He elects us unconditionally. Why does, why did, why did God choose Abraham in Genesis chapter 1? We don't know. Because he's God. Abraham was not a right, by all accounts, we don't know that Abraham was a righteous man or unrighteous man. He just was chosen by God. In fact, we see pretty quickly in Genesis 12, he does a lot of not righteous things, right? Like lying about his, sis, his wife's sister, kind of weird relationship thing. He ends up marrying his wife's servant, that whole deal. So unconditional election, limited atonement means, now this one gets a little squirrely for me because I still have some... I, I, I believe this, but I don't really believe it the way that some hyper-Calvinists believe it. That Christ's work on the cross is limited only to those who are elected. And this is where um, the efficient sufficiency thing 
What does that mean? It means that when Jesus died on the cross, he died for the elect. He didn't die for anyone else. He only died for the elect. I, I, I believe he died for everyone, but it's only applied to the elect. Jesus' work on the cross, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the gospel is sufficient for everyone. Right? But it's only efficient for those who accept it, which is the elect. Now, the part, I did all that just to get to your question. <laughs> Irresistible grace means whoever God calls, they're going to come. There's, no, there's, no, there's nobody that says to God, no. If God says, um, hey, you know what? You're coming into my family. I'm adopting you. I'm, I'm calling you to be one of my own. No one says no to that. Because the power of the Holy Spirit overwhelms our sinful nature. Right? Now, God, people will say no to God's law all the time. That's what sin is all about. People will say no to God's will all the time. That's what sin is all about. But in this is all, so I should point out, this is all based on salvation stuff. This is not based on the decretive versus the preceptive will of God. The irresistible grace part is referencing only the salvation. If God calls you to salvation, you are going to come. If God does it, not if a human being does it. Does that make sense? So I'm, this, this is not talking about the, entire, the entirety of the will of God. This is what we call soteriology. Since you're all theologians now, you've got to learn those words. Soteriology is the study of salvation. So the irresistible grace is the power of the Holy Spirit wooing you to faith in Jesus Christ. You will say yes. Can't say no. Yes. Oh, great. Yes. There you go. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wow. Praise God. That you can't say no. You're not. That's why we have that irresistible part, right? And that's and that's that's what John. That's how John. Actually, how John Wesley did. And I say it's ironic that I'm talking about Calvinism and then I'm using John Wesley as an example because John Wesley and Calvinism they're like very opposite. But John Wesley actually in his life demonstrated this because he said he was at a prayer meeting and he said he felt his heart strangely warmed and he walked out knowing. I'm like. John Wesley, you're a Calvinist, dude. Like, you, like, anyway. The last one's the perseverance of the saints. Perseverance of the saints is the idea that once saved, always saved. There's some, some people don't believe this. Some Christians don't believe this. They say, well, you can lose your salvation. This is why certain churches baptize people like 17 times. And I'm using that number as an exaggeration, but I know people who have been baptized that many times because they don't feel like it's stuck. And, I, and, and in, in, in our tradition, it says, no, 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 God's grace is bigger than, your, than you. And once you're, now, does that mean that you're, you're, on a, you're on this like perfect, like upward trajectory of faith your entire life? Absolutely not. There are times where you're going to go up and you're going to go way down. And you might even feel, and there might be people even looking at you, well, they've lost their salvation. If they get to that point where they feel, you feel like they've lost their salvation, it was, and, and, and again, who are, are we the ones that are actually going to determine that at the end? No. But if a person renounces their faith, I'm done. Okay. You were never a believer in the first place. This is go, now we are, we're not actually going to get to the lesson today. Thank you, Marilyn, for that. That was a good question. <laughs> but. It does go back to what we have talked about in Matthew. Matthew 18, we're talking about the, 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 if, if, if a brother sins against you and they go through the whole cycle of repentance, they don't repent, 
treat them as a Gentile or tax collector. This is what Jesus is talking about. You treat them as though they were never saved in the first place because they weren't. They weren't. Or, or, or yet, the Holy Spirit has cho- is choosing a different time to convict them. Yeah. Why would we have free will? Okay, well, see, that's, yeah, so there's two different types of free will, and one we believe, one Presbyterians believe in, and one we don't. So, again, this is, this is what theologians do. We split hairs, right? But this is actually a pretty big hair to split. This is like an elephant-sized hair. Um, so, the, the type of free will that maj- the majority of Arminians, and by and Wesleyan Arminians, so Methodists, if my dad were here, he would be contradicting me one side or the other because he's a Methodist. Libertarian free will is the free will that says, I can do anything apart from the providence of God. I control. And that if God has, if in God's will, um, he is conforming whatever he does to my will. Or he's, he's choosing me because I'm going to choose him. So that's what the, because the, the Methodists will look at, obviously, the, is the word predestination, predestined, foreknowledge, all that in the Bible? Yes, we just read it. Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1, there's other times as well. And they'll say, oh, well, what they do is they take the word foreknowledge and they apply it to the predestination part, which is two different things. But the, they'll say, well, God has predestined those he already knew would choose him. So God chooses us because we choose him, which is, that's a, I'm going to tell you right now, that's jumping rope because God does not choose, you can't choose something you know is going to choose you, then that thing's already chosen you, right? I'm trying to give you a good, like, let's say you're going to go to a, a, a college, right? You're choosing a college and uh, every other college rejects you but one. Did you really choose that college, or did that college choose you? Yeah, the college chose you. So in libertarian free will, it says that, no, 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 the ultimate choice of salvation is up to the believer, the person. Now, in in free will from a Presbyterian standpoint, we say, well, human beings in their unregenerate state don't have free will. In an un, when I say unregenerate, I mean an unsaved, unaffected by the Holy Spirit state. We do not have total free will. Total libertarian free will. Meaning, a person who is a, who's not been affected by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's not overwhelmed them, they will not choose God. They will not. The only people who had that true um, uh, unregenerate libertarian free will is Adam and Eve. And ushered in, this is, this is the entire book of Romans. Like, this is Romans 1 through 11. They ushered in the, the, the sin nature into our beings, and we're going to follow that sin nature. Now, a, uh, and, and uh, uh, St. Augustine has a great kind of Latin phraseology for all this. Um, but when we are uh, overwhelmed by the power of the Holy Spirit and enabled to by faith come to Jesus Christ, then free will enters into the mix once again for us. Because we're able to either, and this is what Paul talks about when he says, I find two natures at work within my being. I know what I want to do, right? You guys know this phrase? And he says, but the flesh is always right behind me and I cannot seem to do what I want to do. And he says, thanks be to God. Because he's talking about this war in himself. This war, because the sin nature is still there for the regenerate person. It's still there, but now it's being radically overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. It's putting up a fight. It's going to put up a fight, but we are able to choose not to sin. So in the the English, uh, Augustine says... uh, has these three Latin phrases where he kind of describes it. says, in the one case, in the unregenerate state, he uses a double negative. So I apologize to the English majors. 
in an unregenerate state, human being is not able not to sin. They're not able not to sin. Unregenerate state. In the regenerate state, they're able not to sin. And in the glorification state, that's after Christ returns, after you know, we die, go to heaven, we start to share in his glory, and then Christ returns, we are not able to sin. Does that make, make sense? So Adam and Eve, when they were around and kicking, before they bit into that piece of forbidden fruit, they were able not to sin. They had total libertarian free will before the Holy Spirit had to overwhelm their sinful natures because they didn't have sinful natures. We still have a sin nature, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit and access to the Holy Spirit, we're able not to sin. We can say no to sin now. Now, do we always say no to sin? Even as believers? No. Now, prayerfully, we say no to sin more and more as we go. This is what we call progressive sanctification. But the idea, so this is where the Arminian and the, Pre, uh, the Pre Presbyterian get really up. And it all comes down to this part right here, this total depravity part. The total depravity part. Because uh, 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 the free will portion for the, the, um, the Arminian says, no, no, no. There are parts of us that are not affected by sin. There are parts in our human, be, uh, human nature that are not affected by sin. And it's based on those parts that we are able to say yes to God. Now, contrary to my OPC friends, if you don't believe in TULIP, you're not going to hell. If you believe in libertarian free will, and, and you're like, nope, Zach, that's a lot, load of garbage... You're not going to hell. Your salvation can still be secure. It's just we disagree on how it works. This is all about how it works. But the bottom line, and, and, and my OPC friends, um, I don't know if they have friends, but um, my, my OPC, they, they think, well, no, if you don't understand how it works, then you don't understand that it works. And I'm like, no, that's, okay, now you are adding to the gospel. That's what I would say to them. And, and this is why I, I feel perfectly okay, kind of hedging on the limited atonement thing. Because when I read the scripture, and I read John 3, 16 as an example, it says, for God so loved the what? Not the elect. It says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever... I'm like, that's pretty basic. Now, I can agree that the effect of God loving the whole world is only applied to the elect, but the sufficiency of the work can be is available to everybody. It's just that not everybody has a chance, or everybody... Takes, takes ownership of it. Last thing, Bruce, because it's 10.15 and we didn't even get to a single drop of the lesson today. Thank you. Because they believe in, in the libertarian, what, what, what we're talking about over here. They believe in the libertarian view of, 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 of free will. That, and I have a, I have a friend from, from, from uh, my doctorate program. He is a free will Methodist. And he's a church planting free will Methodist. And you can, and the thing is funny is when you go to a lot of these churches and you hear them preach and you hear me preach, you'll say, well, there's not a lot of difference in what you're preaching. Zach, you preach accepting the call of Christ. You preach living out your faith. You preach, I do. I absolutely do. But I know in my head, my heart, that none of that's going to matter if the Holy Spirit's not doing his job. The free will Methodists, the free will Baptists, the assemblies of God, some of the church of Christ, they'll say, no, 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 you have the ability to white knuckle your way into it, into righteousness and into faith. You can white knuckle your way into it. And then Jesus is going to do his work on you. And, and for us, it's no, no, that's backwards. Jesus has got to do his work and convict your heart and, and overwhelm your sinful nature. Then, then you're enabled to do. And, and, God, and, and God doesn't stop working. At the point of salvation. This is why last week, talking about Philippians 2, when, when Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, it's not work for your salvation. It's work out. What does it mean? And Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, is still working that out for you. In you. So that it can go outside of you to others. Well, that was a lot of fun. 
So just by, just by uh, as a reminder, uh, we're taking uh, from here all the way through the month of August, uh, to, to August, the first week in August. So the first Sunday in August, we'll be back. Well, next two weeks, and then the month of July, we're off, right? 18, 25, and then the month of July. So we're off. So um, great time for you guys to argue about this stuff without me here. So you can say all sorts of things, and I won't contradict you or tell you how smart you are either. Um, which is, the, the thing is, here's the thing. I want to say this as we take a, a little summer break. This class is so much fun for me. It really is. You guys ask really great questions and you think very thoughtfully about your faith. And the thing I love about you is I, I know m most all of you, you don't just think about it. You actually try to live this out in your neighborhoods, on the golf course, um, in your schools or your businesses. You actually are trying to live this out, which that is all we can do is to take it into our minds, let it affect our hearts, and then motivate our actions. That's all we can do. And again, all of that happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray because then we got it because I've got about seven minutes till I got to get over to the sanctuary. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful for your goodness to us and ask that you would um, let us feel your Holy Spirit working in us. Um, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's plain. Sometimes we get the goosebumps thinking about it um, and feeling it. And then other times we admit that we are a little numb. Lord, I pray that you would open us up, continually open us up, that we would get excited about your word. Um, that our purpose um, might be in lockstep with your purpose. That our purpose to glorify you and enjoy you would be expressed and felt. That our purpose, the purpose you've given us to love you with all of our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves would be um, easily applicable every single day. We give you all the praise and glory in Christ's name. Amen.